Watch this. Going too far or well within rights. We continue to listen to the debate about the decisions some local medical providers announce to their employees. Get vaccinated or lose your job. After hearing from Idaho Republicans this week, today we turn to the Dems. After a year of delays and uncertainties, we're just one week out from the start of the 2020 Olympic Games. While we count down the hours, we have a look inside Boise's big kickoff party. And the return of Feel Good Friday. Sort of. We're bringing back one of our all-time favorites. And thanks for joining us on your Friday evening. I'm Joe Paris. Brian Holmes is enjoying the day off, but I'm told he's in Las Vegas with the USA basketball team. And I'm told we may have a picture of him. Let's see if we do. Oh, there he is. There's Brian Holmes. We hear he's training after two spots opened up for USA basketball. Kevin Love and Bradley Beal will not be going to Japan, so Brian's giving it a shot. Look at that great athlete there. Brian's so happy to be trying out for USA basketball. Uh, on to the news portion of this show. Yesterday we heard from Idaho Lieutenant Governor Janice McGeehan on the decision that area medical providers made last week on vaccines and employment. If you didn't hear, this was big news. Some select medical employers, they're soon going to require all employees to get a COVID vaccine. If they choose not to, they will lose their job. Now, Lieutenant Governor McGeehan and other Republicans have spoken out saying that this decision, it goes too far. And they say essentially it means a vaccine mandate. Well, critics of the decision say it is wrong to force people to choose between keeping their jobs and getting a vaccine that they don't want for whatever reason. Well, Idaho Democrat leaders have spoken out saying that they support medical providers in their decision. They say they understand that it puts some people in a tough spot, but that overall they support medical providers in their goal of protecting patients and employees by requiring a vaccine. Now, in response to Republican comments we heard this week, today I spoke with Assistant Minority Leader, Democrat Representative Lauren Nekachea. Here's our conversation on this topic. Some of your colleagues on the other side of the aisle have said that they think this is going too far and they're calling for action somehow, maybe from the state lawmakers, maybe from the governor, to prevent that type of action, prevent private employers from saying you have to be vaccinated or you lose your job. Um, what was your stance on that? What do the, the House Democrats think about those calls for to do something to prevent that? Yeah, I think the calls to reconvene the legislature and to try to exploit COVID are really about scoring political points uh, against each other. Um, what we saw yesterday was more of a campaign publicity stunt than a discussion of serious policy proposals. I know we've spoken with Republican lawmakers that say they're hearing from a lot of their constituents that they want to see something done to prevent these private employers from threatening employees with their jobs. Are you hearing that from your constituents or do you think this may be a vocal minority from one group? I think it's a vocal minority of people who have received a lot of misinformation. And you know there are exemptions for people who have deeply held religious beliefs or they have um, a medical condition themselves that would make them vulnerable. I would really encourage people who have questions about the vaccine to talk to their doctor and get those questions answered. It's natural to have questions. Talk to your doctor and get those questions answered so you can make, um, make, make the best choice. I know I was so grateful to be able to get the vaccine and it makes me feel so much safer um, because this is a deadly virus with long-term um, health impacts, even if you survive, and it's putting an enormous strain on our healthcare system. Now, some Republicans have said that they're worried that these vaccine requirements will go beyond the medical profession. You can see construction companies or grocery stores having the same requirements. Do you think that would be fair beyond the medical field? Or do you think that, you know, specifically with these medical employers, it's appropriate, but beyond that, it may be asking too much of employees? I, think, I don't think anybody is discussing that happening. I think we can address that if it comes up. Um, I think right now employers are um, really hungry for workers, as we've seen, and so workers are in a, in a good space to negotiate the terms of their employment, which is something that I, I always want. I always want workers to, to have those strong rights. Um, so we, we can address that if that comes up, but I don't, I don't see any, I mean, I haven't seen any businesses trying to do that. As a leader at the House Democrats, when you see the event yesterday and you hear the calls from some Republicans about reconvening and taking on this issue, um, what are your thoughts? What is the party's reaction to this? Is it really just 
campaigning, you think, or do you think there's a point that's trying to be made? The lieutenant governor is talking about bringing back a, a version of House Bill 140, which would prohibit the state from contracting with any entity that has any vaccine requirements at all. We already considered uh, this legislation during the session. It was not enacted, so case closed. <laughs> you know, there we can't come back and reconvene every time, you know, someone's trying to get some publicity for their campaign. What, all, what we also need to do is, well, while Republicans are trying to score political points on this issue, Democrats have been doing the homework. I requested back in February an attorney general opinion on this type of legislation and their major legal issues, and the state is just going to end up in court if we go down this road. And if you want to hear what Republicans are saying on this issue, we have that article on our website right now, ktvb.com. Something I did want to touch on quickly, though, that Representative Nekachea mentioned, the role of Janice McGeehan at yesterday's press conference event. Now, it's important to remember, she's balancing being the active lieutenant governor and also a candidate for governor in next year's election. Now, critics of McGeehan has said that she used her official capacity as lieutenant governor yesterday to try and further her bid to be the next governor of Idaho by holding an event to address the vaccine decision that those local medical providers have made. Now, to be fair, McGeehan is in a gray area in the sense that her job as Lieutenant Governor, the second highest elected official in our state, well, part of that job is to advocate and push for issues that her constituents are passionate about, issues that she hears about. You can debate whether she represents a vocal minority or not, and if it's appropriate for her to hold events like she did yesterday, but only McGeehan knows for sure if yesterday's event was a campaign stunt or something that she was trying to do as Lieutenant Governor to fulfill her office. It's important to know she's not the only candidate in this boat. So speaking of candidates for governor, not officially yet, but what does Governor Brad Little think about this whole situation? Especially since technically lawmakers never actually adjourned their legislative session for the year, meaning that he would not need to be involved in calling lawmakers back for what could be called a special session, but technically would just be a resumption of the current session. Now, Governor Little was up in Troy yesterday for his Capital for a Day program, and during a speech to the community and about two dozen lawmakers, as well as some other state officials that were in Troy, the governor said that he needs to learn more about the situation, but that lawmakers should not reconvene on that issue, in his opinion. He added that his default position is that it's usually best for employees and employers to work out disagreements. Adding to the story this afternoon, the Senate Majority Caucus released a statement on the issue. In it, they say, quote, As Senate Republicans, we hold firm the belief that state government should not overregulate business. However, individual liberties must be protected to ensure Idahoans are able to work to provide for their families. However, they're not asking for the legislative session to start up again. They're calling on the governor, House leadership, and business leaders to participate in meetings to find solutions that they say will protect everyone, adding, quote, businesses thrive when government involvement is limited and that they hope that they can resolve this without any type of new legislation. Well, it has been hot outside lately, so if you're heading up to Lucky Peak Reservoir next weekend, keep in mind, the water levels may be changing. That's because starting next Friday, the water levels will start to drop to help keep up with irrigation demands. We're going to show you some great drone video that was taken today over at Lucky Peak. Our drone champion Gary Salzman captured these awesome shots. Now, the Army Corps of Engineers says that recreationists need to be aware that as the water drops, the elevation of the boat ramps those will change too, and by mid-September, Lucky Peak is expected to reach its winter water level elevation. At the current moment, the reservoir is at 97% capacity, but Lucky Peak Reservoir is just one of the three that make up the Boise system. That includes Lucky Peak, Anderson Ranch, and Arrow Rock, which sits just above Lucky Peak. Now, the Bureau of Reclamation says that right now, all three combined are currently at 59% capacity. You can see specifically on your screen how those break down. And you're going to be looking here in a moment at drone footage from Arrow Rock Reservoir this morning. And you're going to be able to tell just how much lower the water is here compared to the video we showed you from Lucky Peak. Now, typically, this drawdown doesn't happen until much later in the summer. So why is this happening now? It's been a hot topic here on the 208. Right now, 80% of the state is in a moderate to exceptional drought condition, and a third is experiencing severe drought conditions, specifically in south central Idaho. Now, officials say that they expect there to be below normal water carryover in the Boise system by the fall. 
Well, let me start with a little good news for today. Uh, first of all, the smoke in southern Oregon's been cut off temporarily. At least that's the thinking at this particular time. And as you go outside, you can see that there is a little bit better view of the foothills, not quite as much smoke. And the air quality happens to be a little better as well. If you look at some of these uh, different locations here, you can see we're basically looking at yellow moderate from McCall. Uh, McCall's been up a little bit higher, so it's coming down a bit. Same thing for Horseshoe Bend. Uh, let me back up a little bit here so that we can go into Boise and uh, to show you that, okay, this is the first one we were showing you. We're having the same problem once again. Let me uh, try to back up one more time. Did you see this before? Okay, now let me try to move this down into the Boise area because we have around Nampa, Caldwell, Meridian, it's green. And in the Boise area, it happens to be yellow. Down here toward Twin, it's in the green category. Okay, so that's good. And Sun Valley happens to be in the yellow category. Glad we made it through that. Well, these are some of the temperatures that we had for today, basically up to 96 so far. Again, uh, we're going to be looking at a situation here where we have dry conditions throughout all of the Southwest Valley, but a few thunderstorms that could be coming up here from just the Southwest. So we'll have to watch for that. That's over to the east side of the state. Here's a look at your seven day forecast. Things are looking hot on Sunday. Seven days. 21 minutes and 12 seconds until the 2020 Olympic opening ceremonies. Not that I'm counting down or anything. But who from the 208 is headed out to compete on the world's grandest stage? Sports director Jay Tuss joins the show next. Have a question you've been holding on to that you want me to answer? Well, you can text me. Here's my number, 208-321-5614. Make sure to include your name and the hashtag, the 208. If I don't get to your text on air or at the end of the show, don't worry. You may get a direct response back, so be on the lookout. Just let me know when I'm up and I'll do a pan. Hard to believe, but after a year long delay, thanks to the pandemic, we are now just one week out from the start of the 2020 Summer Olympics in Tokyo, Japan, 2020 Olympics in 2021. Perfect for the times, right? Well, even though we're over 5,000 miles away, Jump in downtown Boise is working on bringing Tokyo to downtown Boise. Let's take you there live. This is a live look right now at Jump where we will be broadcasting live one week from today as we get ready to officially kick off the Olympic Games here on Idaho's News Channel 7. We got a lot of excitement in store for you. Now they're completely transforming the campus down at Jump to make it feel like you're in Tokyo. There'll be Japanese inspired experiences, activities and food that celebrate the traditions of Japan. It's open to the public. Everyone is welcome to attend. And yes, it is free to go down there and hang out. Now, Jump is actually hosting a two and a half week long Olympic viewing party over on their Jumptron. If you haven't seen it, it's awesome. See what I did there? Now, you'll be able to watch the games on their big screens throughout all the games. And I went down there this afternoon just to get a better feel, an idea for everyone on what you can expect over the next few weeks. It's pretty amazing. Here's what you need to know. What are you guys hoping you know, people make of this? I mean, what's the, the goal and the idea behind all of this? So I think that 
Of course, the Olympics are a competition, but it's also a, a moment that every country is looking forward to. It, it um, celebrates the athleticism and also um, teamwork. You know, a lot of the sports are in teams, and we really do want to be a space for human potential. That's, that's, that's what we want. So if people can come and enjoy and get to see a different culture, I know that sometimes we get really um, in our own minds, in our own issues, in our own um, stuff happening in our world or in our household. So this way we can see the world, we can explore, we can see other, other people doing other things. I, last night I was walking and I saw people looking at the globe and I saw this woman kind of standing for the picture. And I, when I looked, she was pointing to Indonesia. And I was like, oh, is that where you're from? I'm like, oh yeah, I'm from Indonesia. I'm like, it's awesome that you can find yourself in, in the map. And that goes for every country, you know, you can go find yourself and we're all part of this big world, right? So it's, we have more things in common than we don't. So the unity and making sure that we all feel welcome is very important for JUMP. I got to see it last night, mm -hmm. lit up. Oh really? And it, it lights up, so it just, it's like a beacon. I mean, I, I saw it coming out of the office and I was just so mesmerized by it that when I drove around to go home, I could see it from the street and it's just like, yep, there's the globe. And so it's really fun. We are so excited to join the jump team down there next Friday for our live broadcast. But before we can do that, we thought we would bring on sports director Jay Tust mm -hmm. to help us break down here on the 208. The people from our area that we can be watching. I know that every year there's new household names that get made, yeah. some from our own state. And I want to get a profile on some of these. The first name I have on my list here, Jordan Andrade. Yeah, what can you tell first me? First off, Joe, no, no tie, right? I'm doing this right on the 208. My is, man. It, is that still a joke on this show? No, it's, it's not a joke. It's legit, man. Hey, no ties allowed. Hey, speaking of legit, though, Jordan Andrade is legit. He's rep re representing Cape Verde. His father was born there. Jordan is a first-generation American, so he's going to go represent his father's country. And, and the great thing that I love about Jordan is that he always provides us this awesome access, this awesome insight into the Olympics games. He's very open about uh, his experiences, and he shares them with us. So he's running the 400-meter uh, hurdles. It is a grueling event, but we'll see. His goal is to make uh, the semifinals. He is the first uh, person from his country, Cape Verde to run in an Olympic semifinal. He did that the 2016 Rio Games. All right, next on my list, and this is an exciting one, uh, in equestrian, Adrian Lyle. Yes, uh, she grew up in Washington, but she did a lot of her training in Ketchum. Uh, she went to the Olympics in 2012, missed them in 2016, but she is back once again. She will be going to Tokyo, and her coach, Debbie McDonald, is also from the uh, Wood River Valley. So uh, a couple of connections when it comes to Adrian. She competes super early in the game. Games, those first few days, we'll be keeping an eye on her. And I know that there are some athletes that may not be native Idahoans, but we're going to claim some. Absolutely. Including athletes that went to the University of Idaho. Tell me about uh, Alicia Butterworth. Yeah, uh, Alicia is uh, going to represent Team Canada. She's a few years removed from running at Idaho, but um, she just recently found out that she did enough to qualify to advance to the Olympic Games. She's got a super fun story, Joe. She's from a small town in Canada. They have a cinder track up there, and she's so desperately wants her community to get a real track, a rubber track so that they can train better on it. So part of this uh, trip to Tokyo for her is getting exposure for her hometown and hoping to raise funds so that she can get the kids in that community a real track. And quickly to wrap up our list mm -hmm. for now, tell me about Liga Valverde. Yeah, she's another uh, fun story, another uh, athlete that competed at Idaho. She's going to represent Latvia and she's one of only seven athletes that will be on Team Latvia. She's going to be running the 800. So um, a few athletes athletes to watch. I forgot to mention that um, uh, Alicia is going to be running the 3000 meter steeplechase. So Ooh. sorry, I, I, I jumped over that one. But either way, those are the four athletes we're going to be focusing on. There are a couple athletes in our peripheral that we'll be focusing on. Um, I know that Kristen Armstrong has trained a couple of uh, cyclists that will be heading over there. Uh, Emma White is one of them. So Haley Batten is another. So again, a couple athletes that I don't know if we necessarily claim for Team Idaho, but we will certainly be keeping track of. Anyone on Team Kristen Armstrong <laughs> is on our team. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, Jay, there are only four athletes on Team Idaho. It seems like a small number yeah. compared to years past. Any reason for that? I, I just think we're kind of in the middle of, of hitting an awesome uh, stretch run here. Now, there's a couple of young athletes coming along. Bora High alumnus Nathan Green, Mountain View uh, former All-American uh, Lexi Halliday. She's running at BYU. Look for a couple of years. I think those athletes start to show back up for Team Idaho. Coverage starts a week from today. We will be back in a moment.
Well, TGIF, everyone, we made it to the end of the week. Congratulations. And normally we end Friday shows with one of our favorite segments, Feel Good Friday. But because Brian is off working with Team USA Basketball, we showed the picture at the top of the show, we're going to bring back one of our all-time favorites from before the pandemic really took hold. This was actually right before the pandemic started. We ran into a group of students from Foothill School who were spending their recess over at Jump. This was in February of 2020. We asked them about their good news. Let's see how this aged. I have news. <laughs> I have news. My little baby brother just turned one. We're really excited. We, we went, went to Lucky, Lucky Fins, Fins together. together. What'd you get to eat? Seafood, including fries. My good news is um, I'm starting a new year of Little League baseball. Little League just started and the draft happened a few days ago and I'm pretty sure I'm on my old coach's team and my best friend's on that team. You're walking around with your grandmother and your mother. That's pretty cool. That is pretty cool. I'm a lucky girl. It's the best. We're lucky. Uh -huh. It is the best. This weekend I am competing in one of my big gymnastics meets in Coeur d'Alene. What is your event in gymnastics? What do you do best? Well, I do all four of the events that I can. So I do beam, bars, vault, and floor. And my favorite event is probably floor. Give me your finishing pose. Uh, well, it's on the ground, but I'll give you my starting pose, I guess. Let's see it. Uh, I am gonna get a hamster because I have money for a hamster and I'm gonna get a hamster and I have its name named Pizza. And why Pizza? Uh, <laughs> I'm going to a ski race in McCall at Little Ski Hill this weekend. You're gonna race? Mm -hmm. Like fast? Yeah. How fast? Pretty fast. I've gone, I think, 49 miles an hour. On skis? Yeah. Down a hill? Yeah. Did that scare you? No. It's my birthday. How old are you? Eight. So what are you doing for your birthday? Uh, I'm gonna have a party with my mom and dad and my brother. My good news is that my daughter was in a play this week at school and she was radiant. She was Elsa in their school play of Frozen. She was super brave and confident and I was over the moon for her. My good news is I learned that I made up a new trick. Let's see it. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Maya. Thank you.
All right, let's take a look at some of your comments to end the show here. Here we got here, hashtag the 208. Uh, this person says again, no one is addressing the fact that we live in a right to work state and that private businesses can put requirements on employees. This is a comment that has been made several times. It was brought up to the Lieutenant Governor. We'll see if this conversation continues. Next, we've got a comment here from Joe. He says, everybody loves a good scar story. How did you get your scar? Well, long story, show, Joe, long story short, Joe, I ran through a wall after watching Terrell Davis and John Elway win a Super Bowl for Denver in the 90s. Uh, do we got one more for us here on your Friday? This person says, my body, your body, get the antibodies. Have a good weekend, everyone.